So today we'll be looking at in-class structure three. So I'm gonna bring that up. In the OLEX, I've opened up the INS. So all I've done is open up the INS and, and this one, or this compound is a kind of like a, it's, it's a in oxide compound. So it's, it's a, it was a compound synthesized by Dr. Larinoff's group. And so it contains nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, fluorine, and as the atom types. And so again, the suggested space group from the machine was P21, but we can do a check. It suggests uh, P21 upon N. So we can switch it to P21 upon N to see if, if we get a st structure solution in that space group. So the suggested space group before we did this, or the original space group was P21 which is non-central symmetric. The uh, space group produced by Olex was P21 upon N, which is central symmetric. So we'll look and see what happens when we do the solve uh, for this. We'll see what Olex picks up when we actually do the solve. So again, we use Shell XT. And so here it suggested P21 upon N. That's what we, the, the space group that was determined. And so what we're looking at here is, is the initials model that was solved. And again, this is an N oxide. And so here we have a trifluoral group. We have this uh, naphthalene ring here. And we have our oxygen off of this. So it looks like it did a pretty good job of doing an initial um, solve model for the for this structure and so if we want we can go ahead and you know i like to name the atoms let me name them so mode naming Let's do a refine, see what the, uh, what we get for refinement. Again, it cycles, it's, it's up to you what you want to set it to. The more cycles you, you put, obviously it takes a little longer, but it converges on the first uh, run through the cycles. If you put a smaller number of cycles, you have to maybe keep on uh, running it until it converges. And the way you know it converges is the shift parameter is green. So again, we use shell XL with least squares method, number of peaks. Uh, you can put this anywhere from zero to 99. We'll keep it at 20 at the moment. The drop down menu, we need to select ACTA. So it writes the SIF file, crystal information file. So there's not really anything left that signifies <clears throat> any missing uh, atoms. So all of this is just disorder in the fluorine atoms and some maybe pi cloud or disorder among the carbon atoms in the ring. So at this stage, we can do anisotropic refinement. So you can either click on this button here next to where it says add H, or you can go to model ANISL as well, so I'll do this one here. And the way you know you have uh, anisotropic parameters is you see these little cross hatches on the, uh, 
atoms. So now once we did the uh, anisotropic refinement, you see our R of 1 is about 11.7, R2 is 32%. And most of the remaining Q peaks, if you look, they're off of carbon atoms. And so this tells us that these are the remaining Q peaks are hydrogen atoms. So we can go and hit add H, and it will add the hydrogen atoms on calculated positions. So with your trifluoro groups, typically they have a lot of, um, they're not very constrained, so they have a lot of movement. So that's why these ellipsoids <clears throat> look a little bit more elongated than uh, usual. And there are things you can do to model this. We'll see if it picks up an error on the check SIF. If it does, then we'll model it. If not, we'll just leave it. And this is common with trifluoro groups. Uh, you have a lot of disorder in the fluorine atoms. Sometimes it's very easy to see the disorder and you can model it accordingly. So now we've done anisotropic refinement. We've done, we've added hydrogens. Let me update the chemical formula. So at this step, we can take a look at our data. And most of it, follows a linear uh, trend. So now we'll check to see if there's any under info, any bad reflections we can omit. And as of right now, there's not many bad reflections to omit. It would come up with red and it would say omit if you suggested any bad reflections. Another thing we can check is reflection statistics. If we go to I over sigma versus resolution, So the green means it's good I over sigma. This red vertical line means that's the cutoff for publishing data, 50 degrees to theta. The red horizontal line means that below this line, the data is very weak and could possibly be noise. So you see around 70 degrees, 69 degrees to theta, this data falls below the three sigma line. So Generally, with molybdenum radiation, you know, a good starting point would be to omit data at 55 degrees and higher. I mean, you could technically omit it at 69 and just get rid of the bad data, but a general convention is we start at 55 because it's you know, not at the uh, boundary of the cutoff between what we need 50 degrees. So I like to set it at 55, but that's arbitrary what you want to set it to. It's up to you. I just set it at 55, but if you wanted to, you could set it at 69. It's just that your R won't be as low as my R value. So that's what I'm going to do. So we go up to edit. We edit instructions. Now in the second set of instructions, you just find a place, insert a new line and say omit negative 355. And again, there are different commands you can use in this shell X that does the same thing. So if you see that someone else, maybe you're reading literature or you're, you're following a workshop with another crystallographer and they do a slightly different command to omit data, it's the same thing. It's just different ways of doing it. So don't be alarmed if they use a different command to omit uh, high angle data. This is just one way to do it. So in, in Shell X, there are multiple ways, or in OLX Shell X, there's multiple ways to do the same thing. So here we've omitted the high angle data, and now we're going to refine it. And this should see a substantial decrease in the R factor because we're omitting that weak high angle data. And so now we're at 7.3% and 22%. So next we can look at the info. We'll check the bad reflections. So sometimes when you omit high angle, there might be some bad reflections show up. So now we're still good. The next thing is the weighting parameters. So since this first weighting parameter is above 0.1, I'm going to go and adjust the weighting parameters 
uh, manually. So I go up to edit instructions and I'm going to set this first one to say 0.07 and the second one I'll set to one just to get a starting point of it. So again, you go to edit instructions, you scroll down to where you see WGHT. You want to decrease the first value, which is default 0.1. And the second value, just put uh, some value to get a kind of a baseline as whether you need to increase or decrease the second value. So we hit OK. So you see our R factor decreased, but our goof also decreased to 1.18. So we do need to increase the second weighting factor a little bit more to bring this goof in line to about 1.1. So we'll also check our reflection. Sometimes when you adjust the weighting parameters, reflections that weren't omitted can become omitted. So that does happen. So I'm going to decrease the first weighting parameter, increase the second one. Again, this is just, you know, you, you adjust it till you're happy with what you see. Hit refine. So what I'm shooting for is to get an, a weighted R2 below 15%. So once I get that below 15%, I usually uh, don't bother with adjusting it any further. Just a little bit more. So since the uh, goof was around 1.02, I didn't mess with the second weighting parameter. I just left it. And we hit refine. We're about at 15%. So I'll stop at this point. We'll do some refinement and see what uh, what pops up, maybe there's some errors or something. So we go to report. So the crystal information, this is usually in the uh, crystalclear.sif file. Let me see if I put it in there. Oh, no, I didn't this time. So for right now, you can just put whatever you want for the color. Typically, this would be uh, presented or given to you by the crystallographer. You just have to enter. Put something reasonable for the values. Don't put like two, three, four. It has to be like, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, uh, you know, 0.25, don't go beyond for any dimension 0.5. So there is, you know, a reasonable um, uh, size values. You can't just put like one, two, three. No, it has to be like, for the older data collections, the biggest the crystal could be was 0.5 millimeters. So as long as your dimensions are less than 0.5, it's okay. For the newer data collections, it's around 0.3. So just for the sake of practicing, just so you don't have those errors, you can put you know, some reasonable numbers for the shape. Uh, the diffraction, you have to enter the temperature if it wasn't automatically added, and that's always 98 Kelvin. And then the absorption correction for most data sets that begin with CD, that's going to be multi-scan. And the T-min and T-max you get from the crystalclear.sif. So let me open that up and get that. Usually T-max is going to be one and T-min will be uh, some other number. So notice here that since we're in a central symmetric space group, you don't see that um, 
absolute structure drop down menu here where it says, you know, how did you determine the absolute structure, anomalous dispersion, unknown, etc. Because this is a central symmetric space group, there's no flag parameter, there's no absolute structure determination. So we hit refine. Now, since I know that there will be some errors associated with certain information that didn't get transferred from the crystalclear.sif, I'm going to add that now to uh, just minimize the number of errors that I'm going to have. And this is the, uh, the ones involving the cell, what is it called? Cell measurement reflections used, cell measurement theta min. So I'm going to copy those and paste it into the edit SIF info. So now that, and then the other one is the measurement device type. So I'll go down there and find that. There we go. So now when you refine it again, it automatically updates that information. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, do a check SIF and see if we have any uh, errors associated with the structure. See if it works today. So I, I, in this model, <clears throat> I've purposely left some wrong atom types in. So we see if those errors associated with those wrong atom types pops up on the check sift. So it can show you how you can evaluate that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop this share and bring up the check sift. So here's the check SIF report. So one thing that you should notice is that our Z value is off. It should be four because again, it's central symmetric. There's one molecule in the, the asymmetric unit. So there's gonna be four molecules in the unit cell. So we have it set to two. So that's something that we need to adjust and we can do that. So that's one thing. So here is important. You see alert level B, Hirschfeld test difference, O1 to C10, Hirschfeld test difference, C1 to C10, and C9 to C10. So what this means is that when you look at C10's thermal ellipsoids and you compare it with the neighboring atoms that it touches, those neighboring atoms have a bigger thermal ellipsoid than C10. And so this is a very common error when you misassign an atom type. So let's say, for example, something is supposed to be an oxygen and you label it a carbon, or something is a nitrogen and you label it a carbon, or it could be maybe a sulfur and you label it a phosphorus. This test will tell you, say, hey, there's something wrong here. You need to investigate. Now, sometimes it could be due to disorder but if you look at the thermal ellipsoids and they all look relatively, you know, normal looking, there's not a lot of disorder, then you can, you can disregard the disorder. So the fact that this C10 is a lot smaller thermal ellipsoid than the surrounding atoms indicates that maybe this C10 was misidentified. Maybe it's not a carbon, it's something else. Uh, just one other note about the Hirschfeld test differences is that Sometimes this error will pop up when you have a metal that coordinates to say a nitrogen, uh, oxygen or whatever. That's okay if those Hirschfeld test differences pop up because that's not uncommon when you have a metal, non-metal interaction. You may see Hirschfeld test differences uh, pop up. Just investigate it, but it's, it's okay if there's no issue there. 
that's not a problem. But for this, since there's no metal, we have to investigate uh, further. So that's something we need to take a look at. And other than that, it looks pretty good. So the two things we need to look at are the fix the Z value and adjust the look at C10 and see if it could be something else other than a carp. So now let me uh, bring back the Olex. So in this case, the disorder in the trifluoromethyl group is, is, is allowable. So we don't have to worry about that. So if we look at this C10, which is right here, it's connected to the oxygen, you can notice that it is smaller than O1, C9, and C1 ellipsoids. And if you notice, though, C1 and C9 ellipsoids are very similar in size to the rest of the ellipsoids in the ring. So this is a good indication that there's not much disorder in this ring. So these ellipsoids are, you know, nicely sized. You also notice that on this carbon that we label carbon 10, there's this little bit of electron density off of it saying, hey, there's some extra electron density that's around this atom. So then we have to think, you know, uh, using our intuition about chemistry, what other atom type could fit this position? Well, obviously it can't be an oxygen. And obviously it can't be something smaller than carbon because if it's smaller than carbon, it would actually shrink the ellipsoid. So let's say, for example, you thought it was a boron. You can't, it, it'll be even worse, the thermal ellipsoid, because it's smaller now, it's going to shrink. It's going to get tinier. So obviously it has to be heavier than carbon. So we have to look at our, what we know about connectivity and atom types. So for example, it could be a nitrogen because nitrogen can be three uh, coordinate or SP uh, two, uh, SP, it's actually SP3 hybridized because you have a lone pair. It couldn't be oxygen. If it's oxygen, then it would be, you'd have this weird oxygen oxygen bond, which doesn't make any sense. And, and likewise, oxygen is typically, you know, SP3 hybridized with two bonds. It can't be a fluorine because fluorine only wants a single bond off of it. So just by looking at our possibilities, the best obvious atom type is a nitrogen. Because again, since it's not too much smaller than the neighboring ellipsoids, it's going to be something close to carbon. And so here we're going to label this a nitrogen atom. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because sometimes Shell XT does misassign atom types. So you have to inspect and make sure everything is identified correctly. Secondly is sometimes in your initial structure solution, you may not see any differences, but when you do the check SIF, it will find differences in the structure as, as far as regards to ellipsoids. So now I've labeled this nitrogen. So let me go and relabel the carbons. Not Q1. Mode. All right, now we're gonna go refine again. We should see a decrease in the R factor because we corrected an atom type. So you see we, we a substantial decrease. We were at 15% R2, and now we're at 12.9% R2, and our goof dropped, because what happened is we have a better a model for the observed data. So that's why the goof drop, the R factor dropped. So that was a good thing that we changed this atom type. And now notice that this ellipsoid on the nitrogen is relatively similar in size to its neighboring ellipsoids. 
So now what we can do is since the goof went below one, we can decrease the second weighting parameter and it'll raise the goof up to one. So let me redo the chemical formula. And while we're here under edit instructions, I'll show you how to update the Z factor as well. So here where it says the line, the command line Z E R R, what this command line contains, it contains the Z factors, the error associated with the lattice parameters. So the Z factor is the first number, this two. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the two to a four. That's all you do. So again, the first number in this command line is the Z value. It was two. All you do is you highlight it. You type in four. That's it. Nothing else you need to do. Now we'll scroll down. And we're going to decrease this second weighting parameter. We'll try 1.5 and see what happens. And so this is good. I mean, our R factor went up just a tad, not uncommon. Our goof is 1.01. .01. This is a good happy place. So we can stop here and let's do the check SIF report one more time. So let me uh, stop share here and we'll show you the check SIF. So see now our Z value has been updated four and four. Our Moiety formula, some formula are now correct because we have the correct Z value. We scroll down here, those B errors are gone because now we've correctly assigned that atom type. And it's just C and G errors. So this is, you know, ready for uh, publication. So that concludes in class structure three. Before we begin with the next structure, I'll stop here. If there's any uh, questions, feel free to ask.